Hey guys, welcome back. Now first off, I'd like to say I'm very privileged and honored to be doing this collaboration video with Dr. Angie. Um, a little background on her, she, she got her undergraduate degree from the University of Calif California, Irvine. Her major was Molecular and Cell Biology, and her medical education was from Ross University School of Medicine. Um, she's had a long run of um, internships and residency training in internal medicine. She's done some medical medicine fellowships and, and fellowship training and um, she's worked at various medical uh, centers and now she has her own private practice. Uh, she specializes in gastroenterology. So, um, I mean, there's no one better to uh, discuss um, gut health and fiber and digestive health and all and these kinds of topics with none other than Dr. Angie, a board certified medical doctor. Um, and so specializing in gastroenterology. So what I'd like to do is let me just go ahead and take you guys into my segment here of the fat loss component of fiber. Um, this is going to be really fun. So thank you guys for coming along. Coming along. Now I'm going to card previous videos that I've done. As you guys, the, the more these things kind of like gel together, you realize that I'm speaking truth. I'm speaking evidence-based science. That's cutting edge. First off, we have nutrient access, okay? Um, well, well, you know, before I get to that, I talked about my anti-nutrient autophagy video, which could be anti-diabetes and anti-obesity. This is courtesy of Dr. Rhonda Patrick and her video on autophagy. Nutrient deprivation, now I shortened the formula, there was some other aspects, but basically it leads to a decrease in mTOR, which is an anabolic pathway, and it increases AM, AMP kinase, okay? Um, which kind of gets stimulated in like, you know, fat loss and caloric restrictive uh, situations. So in my mind, I thought to myself, hmm, I did a video um, and I was looking at um, nutrient excess. In fact, I'll go ahead and card it here where I looked at nutrient excess and how it's impact on obesity, right? Um, and I talked about how anti-nutrients will reduce absorption of nutrients. But what kind of nutrients? More than likely macronutrients and maybe even some micronutrients. But I think it's mainly macronutrients and that's where fiber comes in, okay? So nutrient excess based on this here, in fact, all the studies you'll see are down below in the video description that support everything I'm saying here. Nutrient excess leads to an increase in mTOR and a decrease in AMP kinase, which can increase insulin resistance and so forth, okay? Now what's fascinating is you have this this complete dichotomy, a, a dichotomous uh, situation or reaction. Deprivation decreases an anabolic pathway, which makes you more body fat catabolic, and, AMP, and increases AMP kinase. Nutrient excess, which is prevalent in obesity, means we're over-absorbing calories, right? We're eating too many calories and we're absorbing too much. Increases mTOR, increases anabolic pathway, which I talk about in my resistance training uh, weight of the evidence video on obesity being a primary and anabolic state. Now you can throw in some paradoxical catabolic situations there like sarcopenic obesity, okay? But I want to simplify this to the fact that obesity is primarily an anabolic state because you're in energy excess, nutrient excess. All right, so what does fiber have to do with all of this? Well, as you can see here, when you increase fiber, that leads to a decrease in, in metabolizable energy. Well, what is metabolizable energy? It is the energy available to the body after correcting for losses in urine, urine and stool, okay? So fiber basically is a nutrient deprivator, okay? It, de it decreases the bioavailability of certain nutrients and particularly carbs. And let me give you an example. Uh, white kidney beans are like a known carb blocker in the, su in the supplement world. Well, they're basically preventing the overabsorption of carbohydrates. It's modulating carbohydrate absorption. In other words, you're going to lower the glycemic index, which is going to increase fat oxidation at rest. And then you have the resistance starch component. I mean, you, we can go on and on about this. But as you can see, this is, this is where calories in. Let me get another marker here to make this clear. Calories in versus calories out. People talk about that. That depends on the food source. Are we talking about processed foods or unprocessed foods? If we're talking about processed foods, this is correct. Okay? If you read the label, it's correct. But we're also kind of th throwing satiety and all these other aspects and really optimal health under the bus, quite frankly. Because if we're eating like Pop-Tarts and we're counting calories, yeah, we'll lose weight. But there's other aspects like uh, the, 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 the pro-inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory aspect of food. Now, if we look at unprocessed food, like when you throw fiber into the mix, a high fiber diet through plant-based foods, 
Calories in does not equal calories out. This is the difference between mathematics and metabolics. Okay, and Dr. Bouchard actually talks about this in his, um, he's a longtime pioneer researcher, uh, uh, um, I believe he's uh, also a geneticist, and he works out of the uh, LSU Pennington Health uh, Medical Center. Um, I referenced that in a video, and I'll go ahead and I might act, actually add it to this video. But if you look at the bottom of this video, there was a whole grain versus refined grain study, and they, and they basically corroborated this aspect of calories in does not equal calories out because we lose a lot of the calories through basically uh, the toilet bowl. And Dr. Furman talks about this in, in, in other videos, in resistant starch, and in gut microbiome. Um, and what are the health benefits of that? Well, uh, studies show that it actually will reduce the risk of colon cancer because you're reducing the, you're, uh, reducing the, the, the colonic transit time. Um, anyway, so what I, what I purport and what I propose is that when it comes to metabolics and fiber, it's calories ingested versus calories digested. That's the difference, okay? So it's actually not that bad of a thing because what happens is, is what we read on a label is one thing, but when it enters our body, it, it, it's, it's a game changer. Fiber is a game changer, okay? That's why... I refer to it as the hidden fat loss code because it defies what we read on a label. In fact, you can look at the studies on nuts. Nuts have a low metabolizable energy because one of the purported theories is fiber bound fat. The fiber lat latches onto some of the fats and we don't absorb as much, as much of the fat. So in, it, in essence, fiber is a carb and a fat blocker and even a protein blocker. So with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and throw it back to Dr. Angie and let her take it away. Thank you guys for watching and keep, and keep watching, enjoy. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I really appreciate the introduction. Um, as you know, Yvonne and I uh, love fiber. So here we go. I'm going to talk a little bit more about fiber and the benefits of fiber. As a gastroenterologist, I'm interested in gut hormones. So I want to associate gut hormones with the intake of fiber and what happens uh, physiologically when you eat fiber. So fiber is an important hormone in obesity and um, eliminating um, hunger and uh, so um, it's important to talk about that and how is it that fiber um, basically controls appetite and decreases glucose so it's recommended in patients with diabetes or anybody in fact. Um, so here we go. GLP-1 is a, is a very important gut hormone that is associated with bringing down glucose and helping increase satiety or um, helping you feel full. And so that's how fiber is able to modulate these kinds of pathways. It's through GLP-1, which is the satiety hormone. So let me talk to you about that and how is fiber associated with this hormone. As you eat food, the food travels through the GI tract and ends up in the distal small bowel, the jejunum and the ileum. In the ileum, um, there are cells called the L cells. When the L cells um, come in contact with fiber, um, they're able to produce the hormone GLP-1. GLP-1 sends a negative inhibition to the stomach and asks it to slow down. So that's how fiber is able to slow the gastric emptying. So um, what does that do? Well, you stay full for longer and have satiety, so then it's hard to overeat when your stomach is full, right? So that's how fiber does that, but also centrally um, uh, through nervous system pathways, probably through the parasympathetic nerves or the vagus nerve, um, it sends a signal to the brain and tells you you're full and your appetite is under control, so don't overeat. So those are two mechanisms, but fiber, unlike other nutrients who could also do this, um, has something special to offer. Okay, so unlike other nutrients, fiber has the, the ability to uh, collaborate with the microbiome to also produce GLP-1. So when you eat fiber, um, the fiber comes, the soluble fiber ends up into the colon, and in the colon, as you know, we have trillions of microbiota or bacteria that, that live there um, who um, are also involved in the process of digestion. When fiber travels here uh, th through the microbiome, it produces short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids through unknown mechanisms are also further, further able to increase um, 
GLP-1, which also has the ability to slow down gastric emptying and suppress your appetite. Okay, so those are the two mechanisms. But I also want to touch on um, resistant starches because Yvonne was talking about resistant starches and how important they are. Um, but it, just keep in mind, resistant starches are not very well digested in the small bowel. So they escape the small bowel, they come into the colon, and guess what? The resistant starches are also able to produce um, uh, short-chain fatty acids, which also, again, have the ability to increase GLP-1. And you would ask me, if you ask me what kind of resistant starch um, are we talking about, I would say white beans. Those are uh, the example Yvonne used, and I really like that. Beans um, have resistant starches who that are able to increase, um, help you with satiety through this mechanism. I hope that helps, uh, and uh, subscribe to my channel so you never miss a video. Thank you for listening.